We know that any weapon formed against us shall not prosper. We know that his goodness, and he is a good God, prevails everlastingly to everlastingly. And I say that word everlastingly because heaven is in earth now, and it is forever and ever. Can you say amen? That's just so cool. Today is the first day of our salvation, and it is an everlasting salvation. I am learning to keep my eyes upon Jesus and not to allow any distraction, anything from the world to sway the very fact of my deep and eternal belief. And belief is given only to God because he is the one. He said, blessed are those that have never seen and yet believe. So today, I would like all of us to pray together this prayer out of First, Second Chronicles. And we're going to begin with verse 13 and 14. This is Second Chronicles 7, verse 13 and 14. And let's just read it aloud, everyone together. And I will start in just a moment with the thoughts that his prayers are answered. I know that. I have had so many miraculous answers to prayer this year that I could you know, spend the whole time just telling you how wonderful it's been. So let's read. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes are open, my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For I have chosen and sanctified this house, this is verse 16, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. I love that word, perpetually. That is an ongoing forever statement, forever and ever. And I will establish the throne of my kingdom. Consider the fact that that is yet to be happening in the millennial rule of Christ. This is a messianic prophecy, and there are many more just like it from the Old Testament. We know that over 350 prophecies were fulfilled in the first coming, and we know that the only one that hasn't been fulfilled is that he will come again. And now we see and know that the eternal God shall let yet fulfill all that he has said he would fulfill. Today, my friends, we are going to see God answer prayers. From this day forward, believe. How many will say, yes, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. Would you believe that you are an overcomer? Would you believe that the gates of heaven are wide open to you? Would you believe that today, even right now, his heaven is in you and that you are in the eye of a storm? You are in the center the very center of his love and his protection. His mercies are new every single day, just as Susan opened in prayer with those beautiful words. Yes, yes, his mercies are new every day. And I sense his presence right now, just as, again, Susan said, whenever two or three are gathered together, there he is in the very midst. And my Lord, I just thank you for your your sovereignty and your presence and your love and your protection and your keeping power. And we pray this day for all of our family, all of our church, as they open this week, we thank you for those that have had the courage to speak forth and to go forth and to walk in places where even angels fear to tread. So today we lift up Sean Foy and all of the believers that are calling the body of Christ to awaken in this very day. We, we thank you, Father, for Sean. We ask God that you would be with him. Open a way before him this very, very day. And Father, we ask 
even as we've prayed all through um, these past few months, that the election would be honest and fair, and that all things will come together, yes. and that you would prevail in the midst of this. Yes. And we thank you, Father, for your love and your keeping power. Today, we need Barbara, our Barbara Dominic. Would you mind if if you have the? I'm trying to record, but I need rec permission from you. Would you Would you like to record this? Absolutely. If you would, if you'd set the record on, that'd be great. All right. Uh, thank I don't you. want to miss any gems. <laughs> How do I do that? Um, on, your, on, your, on your spot. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Allow to record. Praise yes, God. I just did it. Good morning, Kim. We have been opening in prayer. We've been believing God for all good things, and we welcome you, our sister. We thank you for coming in on our meeting. We know that what we're doing here is an eternal moment. I believe with all my heart that God has put us together for such a time as this, that our prayers, our prayers matter, and that we are calling up to heaven for intervention, the holy angels to be upon all of us. And I believe that he is touching each and every one of us. He has said something very powerful in scripture that is in John 13, that he will never despise the humble and the broken and the contrite person. And that's all of us. We look to that scripture just as a beginning. The Lord said in Isaiah 57 and verse 15, he said, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity. And we've been talking about eternity and eternal purposes and the fact that heaven is in earth even today and that we can trust his holy presence. He says, I dwell in the high and holy place with him and her also that is of a contrite and a humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble to revive the heart of the contrite one thank you father for i will not contend forever do you like that word contention oh wow yes there are so many that have their eyes blinded in this day they just simply don't know the beat of the right drummer they just don't know the voice of the shepherd and in this last week and especially even in the last few months i have been listening to the voice of the shepherd and i've shared with you perhaps some of you um, the fact that the lord has spoken so clearly in my life in the last few months and he has said expect a miracle Today, right now, I contend for the miracles that will come upon this land. And today, each and every one of you have a voice to say to God, yes, Lord, I contend for deliverance of our whole nation. Can you say amen? Can you agree with mm -hmm. me that we say, yes, we contend with you, Lord. And we are broken because we have been broken in our lives. And, and we are contrite. We are broken. We are not, we're like powder. They can never be put back together again. That's what the word contrite means. It's broken even to, to uh, powder, powdery uh, effects that it can never, ever be put back together. We are broken and spilled out in you, God, in great love for you. And you were broken and spilled out for us on the cross of Calvary. And we believe today in the life, the death, the resurrection, the eternal life of Jesus Christ. And that's why we are together as believers. The Lord will not contend forever with the enemy that has risen up in the land. And there is further scripture um just amazing discussions that we want to look to today there is a story out of the old testament i'm going to start here while people are coming in there are a few more that are joining us and um the amazing thing is that the lord had victory and it was in the valley of jehoshaphat and i'm, I'm you know i'm going to ask um david if you would remember that story and i and i'm just gonna put the, put you on the spot which is uh, out of uh second chronicles again second chronicles. i have it in front of me but i'm gonna put you on the spot because you're my fellow theologian here and you, if you would like to discuss that um oh, let's let's read it first second chronicles yes for chapter seven 
well, we are, we have just been in chapter seven uh -huh. and verse 14. And we have just mentioned that. Go ahead and start that one again. Okay. Read that again. We just read that. Okay. So start, start with verse 14. Yes, please. Okay. Uh -huh. <clears throat> okay. Verse 14. And this is the King James. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Continue. Um, let's read another scripture now. This is First Chronicles, back a few pages, chapter 4 and verse 10. Here is the blessing of Jabeth out of Chronicles. The Old Testament, you see, is the uh, hope for the New Testament. And the New Testament is that which fulfills the Old. The whole Bible, absolutely every bit of it, comes together. So if you will read chapter 4 and verse 10 of First Chronicles, this will be our jumping off. <laughs> place today. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, go ahead, everyone together. And Jabeth called on the God of Israel. This is what he said. Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my coast and that thy hand might be with me and that you would keep me from evil and that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. So Father God, we will begin our time together. And I would ask, Father, that you would give us a clear yes to the prayer of Jabeth. That you would bless us, Lord. You would protect us. That you would keep us from the evil one. That you would cause us to be effective and effective in our day and open up the borders of our house so that we might reach out into the harvest field. Amen. Amen. And that's a bit of a paraphrase, but it does speak of what God is doing in this day. Again, we are going to be studying John 13 today. And, um, be, but before I do get into that, um, I, I really wanted to lift up some of the promises of God, because I think we're in great need of that today. And I want to admit other people just for a few moments. And um, I believe there is a prophecy in Ezekiel that we need to also look at. And this would be Ezekiel chapter 37, and it would be <clears throat> verses 26. Could you repeat That's that scripture? Well, yes, it would be Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 26. And I want to read a few of these powerful messages out of the Old Testament to encourage us today. This is why we're doing this. And I'll begin to read. I will make a covenant of peace with them. That would be us. It shall be an everlasting covenant with everyone. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. Verse 27. My tabernacle also shall be with them. And yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forever. I praise God for the fact that we believe and that we can give that prayer of Jabeth and that he will answer and that he will keep us from the evil one and that he will multiply our effectiveness and that he will be with us in his sanctuary. Now there are scriptures that say he's hiding us in the chambers, in his secret chambers for such a time as we're going through. And I believe that that's happening for so many of us. 
I have expected a miracle all year and I've seen it happen everywhere I look in my family, miracle after miracle. And I know he's protecting all of us. I know he's protecting all of you. And I know that we have all come into that sanctuary of God. You know, in the scriptures, we can read where the priest couldn't stand because of the presence of God. And I'm believing that for each of you, that as you come deeper into the presence of God, that he will so fill your home and your life right now, even where you are, that you will hardly be able to stand. There are times where he just touches my life. And, and I know that he has done another wonderful thing in my home and my family in the midst of the chaos because I keep my eyes on Jesus so that I can walk on the water over the problems, over these troubles. And John 13, John 12 and John 13, these are powerful scripture. And, and as we studied out um, the book of John, and as we've seen uh, the way John wrote the scriptures, I, we can see it as an envelope, a covering, as we come into deeper belief, deeper understanding. How, how do we receive faith but from the word, from the hearing of the word? And John the Beloved was the very closest to Jesus. John himself was called the Beloved because he was beloved of God. And today I declare that God calls you Beloved. God calls you the Beloved. Will you believe that? you believe that you are like John the Beloved. His beloved conversation is with you, full of belief, full of understanding that yes, God, yes, you will quiet the enemy. You will silence those that are against me because there's more with you than with, than with the enemy. Can we believe that today? As we see the, the news unfold, Keep your eyes on Jesus. He is the king of glory. He is entering into our heart. He is our good shepherd. We hear his voice. He is the crucified suffering shepherd, and he is the lamb of God. He is all in all. If we keep our eye upon who he is, we know that he is prevailing, and he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Our Jesus, he spoke to John the Beloved because John loved him enough to go all the way to the cross. In the day of Jesus, the Romans were horribly terrible, awful, just like we have seen the rising up of the enemy in this day. It's the same enemy, you know, yesterday that it is today. It's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And frankly, it's the same battle of evil against good. It just has a little different look to it. So in the day of John, John the Beloved, it was chaos. It was death. It was murder. It was accusation. It was riot. It was everything that we're seeing today. And they took our Jesus. They took the God of the universe, and they nailed him to the cross. And they want to do that today. They want to destroy everything good in our nation. They want to get rid of holiness and goodness and righteousness and God. It's the same thing that they did in the day of Jesus. And they nailed him to the cross, but he rose from the dead. And he said to those that were close to him, even the ones that uh, were nailed to the cross with him, in this day, you shall be with me in paradise and the thief on the cross believed had a strong belief and he was caught up to abraham's bosom that very day so john the beloved was at the foot of the cross the precious blood was flowing out of the feet of jesus and the blood of christ you see covered all of the sins of the world everyone the blood covered the world with salvation for whomsoever would believe. This is where we are today, my friends. Whomsoever believes shall be saved. I do not know what's going to happen, and no one here does. Only God knows. But we do know we can trust him. Can you say amen? amen. I want to hear amen. that. Come on. <laughs> we can trust him. Amen. 
Yes, he is a covenant maker. And he says in the book of Roman, Romans, he said he, he is the king of peace and he will crush the enemy under his feet. Amen. Can't, can't wait. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah, well, we're pretty close. <laughs> Praise God. My friends, John the Beloved, he was given the care of the mother of Jesus. We've studied this. And he wrote the book of Revelation because he was the closest to God. And the unveiling of eternity was given to John the Beloved. And throughout the scriptures, as we have studied them week after week for more than a year, and we've been together doing this, and I'm wondering just what providence it was that we began Zooming long before perhaps some of us even knew what Zoom was. We began doing this because God wanted this to be done. And he wanted it to go forth and to proclaim the gospel. And it will be recorded and sent forth into the world, whatever comes from it. There'll be other salvations from our time meeting here even today. I believe that. Can you say amen? <laughs> Please mm -hmm. agree with me. There will be salvations that come from our meeting today. There is such connection. There is such agreement with all of you here today. And we're going to go forth in just a moment. I just want to finish a little bit of the um, undergirding of why we're here together and what God is doing. What he's doing is listening to our prayers. We have been broken and we are contrite. Everyone on this Zoom meeting today has had dealings with God in their life. We've gone through the gauntlet, so to speak. And in the midst of it, we've continued to believe and to know that his truth is eternal. That what he said will come to pass. So today, look at John, the beloved. He was writing even his gospel. He didn't even know it because God is the author of the divine gospel. And John the Beloved experienced, eyewitness experience, the very things that he was later able to record that becomes the divine gospel today. It is a divine gospel because it brings heaven to earth. And that essentially is the topic of John 13. In the first chapter, he welcomes all the disciples. And there was a great number of different disciples of many different places and different backgrounds and different occupations and different careers. But there was only one that was at the cross. The others ran away. The others were frightened. My friends, this is kind of the way it is today. There's a small percentage that will be like this Mary Magdalene. And this is out of the book of John in chapter 8. And this is the one that that actually was forgiven the most. The one that loved Jesus so much that she wept on his precious feet and poured the oil, the broken alabaster box. And it's recorded in a chapter where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Yes, the light of the world. But what did the world love? The world loved darkness because her deeds were evil. Ah, oh, 2020. Do you see that out there right now? They turned away from the light because their deeds were evil and they were not listening to the voice of the shepherd. It's the same voice calling, I love you. I love you with an everlasting love. I love you with everything in my heart. I'm going to go to the cross of Calvary. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to die so that my blood, because I'm the Lamb of God. Chapter 1, John, proclaimed by John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb. Of God. His blood shed for the whole world. And then there were those that would see him perform miracle after miracle. His disciples walked with him to the first miracle in John 2. And here he turned the water to wine. And here they were amazed. What did that speak of? Water to wine? It spoke of humanity to divinity. It spoke of the Old Testament and the fulfillment in the New Testament. He is the new wine. He is the new outpouring. And with that said, 
I believe it would be a good moment for us to take communion together. We said that we would, and I hope that you all received that message. And so if you have the elements with you, I'm going to actually um, do that with you right now. And um, in the moment that Jesus met with his disciples, and did you know that the book of John only records the last three and one half years of the life of Jesus? And that the last week, the last week takes up most of the book of John? You know that, don't you? Because John the Beloved wrote the eternal things of God. Jesus recorded in the book of Corinthians, took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may partake. And then, he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the New Testament, the New Testament that is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he said, whenever you meet together, celebrate my life. And he said, I would not partake of this with you again until we meet together. And in this in eternal states. Now, I'm thinking about that and I realize that the very presence of God is with us right now. I, I sense his presence is all over my tiny little studio. And, and I know he's all over you because you are dear, wonderful believers who have given your life and your heart to God. And you are contrite and broken and your life has been spilled out in so many different ways for the love of your family and the love of all that you know and your prayer time that's a spilling out and so that brings you into the beloved and you are like jabeth you you can pray forth and believe god is going to answer and so i got to thinking about that statement that jesus made until i come with you again in the eternal states that's why i can believe that eternity is beginning now because it begins because he is the indwelling Jesus. He dwells in each and every one of us by the miracle of the new birth. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. There is going to be a physical return of Christ, but there is also the spiritual return that comes together. You cannot separate the spirit and the, and the flesh. I, I just don't believe that. But Jesus just said, into your hands I commend my spirit on the cross. So that must mean that the spirit of God is eternal. Heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together. One God, eternal, together with us forever and ever. That is what I believe. This, dear Mary Magdalene, is one of the two Marys, and maybe more, at the cross and she loved Jesus. So she went all the way to the cross. She had a agape love, the kind of eternal love that you and I have for Jesus, because we would do anything. When anything comes, we would say, yes, Lord, take me, because I'm ready to go. And I know that I'm with the right group today. Anything that comes, you would say, yes, Lord, yes, I'm ready for you. There was another Mary, and she had what is called the kingly anointing. And that is the Mary of Bethany. She was at the Last Supper. And at the Last Supper, she also poured oil upon the head of Jesus and anointed him. And that speaks of unity. And Jesus said something a little different to that Mary. And, um, you know, again, I could call on David uh, because, but I don't want to put you on the spot. But Jesus said, to that Mary of Bethany, wherever you remember this sacrifice of her and true credible love, it will be a memorial under her. So that connects us with the, the doctrine of Eucharist, of communion that we have just 
celebrated together. Whenever we meet together, you see, let's celebrate Jesus and the unity that we have. There was unity that day in the upper room. There was unity and the togetherness. Now, that means Psalms 133. It means that he will command the blessing. We are united together, my friends. And as we pray together, as we lift up the name of Jesus, as we pray for our loved ones, as we pray for the dissolving of the enemy's efforts in this day, we are together in unified belief that he will do exactly what we've asked. Can you say amen? All right. I'm going to ask, uh, actually, um, seems to me that Carla, I don't know if I've uh, got anyone else here, but Carla, would you take the scriptures and read for us the very beginning of John 13? Would you do that as we go forward with our study today? And it would begin on chapter 13 of John and reading from verse 1 all the way through verse 13, would you please? Uh, yes, uh, before I do that, um, since you've mentioned Jabez several times, yes, I'd like to um, share an insight that was given to me several years ago about Jabez. Yes, please. Um, you know, he was, if you think about it, kind of this obscure prayer in the Old Testament that in our day got lifted out and became a theme of a book. And I was thinking about Jabez's prayer about enlarging his territory or enlarging his influence. And I was thinking to myself that Jabez would have never dreamed that his prayer would one day in the 20th century or 21st century be brought forth as a motto and a theme for people. In other words, his name became known like, what, 3,000, 4,000 years later. And, you know, and then his prayer was a book was about the prayer of Jabez. His name and his prayer were put on coffee mugs. Um, his, his prayer was put on mouse pads. <laughs> And I was just thinking about how God didn't just answer his prayer way back then, but his ex the um, expansion of who he was and his influence extends to our day. And one of the things that reminded me of is that when we in our day feel obscure, unknown, like does my life make a difference? Are my prayers making a difference? that we have no concept we could be a thousand years from now and know that somehow something we said <laughs> influences someone it just was quite remarkable for me to consider that the prayer of jabez uh, was so expanded that it became part of us today yes. as um as a prayer for all of us to yes. see be expanded anyway i thought that was interested Carla, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. You always have such insightful and wonderful things to say. And I'm wondering if um, uh, you would go ahead and read that section of scripture as I asked you to. Um, chapter 13, verses 1 to 13. Would you do that, please? Sure. I'm reading out of the Amplified. Oh, I like that. Now, before the Passover feast began, Jesus knew, was fully aware that the time had come for him to leave this world and return to the Father. And as he had loved those who were his own in the world, he loved them to the last and to the highest degree. So during supper, Satan, having already put the thought of betraying Jesus in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, Jesus, knowing and was fully aware that the Father had put everything, uh, whoops, had put everything into his hands and that he had come from God and was now returning to God, got up from supper, took off. Am I reading in the right place? Oh, yes. Perfect. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. 
got up from supper, took off his garments, and taking a servant's towel, he fastened, fastened it around his waist. Then he poured water into the wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the servant's towel with which he was girded. When he came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are my feet to be washed by you? It is for you to wash my feet. Jesus said to him, you do not understand now what I'm doing, but you will understand later on. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, unless I wash you, you have no part with me, no share in companionship with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, wash not only my feet, but my hands and my head too. Yes, thank you so much. Carla. That's the 10. Yes, oh, that's, that's fine. Go to 13? Okay. Yes, please, go to 13. Jesus said to him, anyone who is bathed needs not to wash, but is clean all over. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who he was going, he knew who was going to betray him. And that was the reason he said, you are not all of you clean. So when he had finished washing their feet and had put on his garments and had sat down again, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me the teacher, master, and the Lord, and you are right in doing so, for that is what I am. The great I am has spoken. I am whatever you need me to be. I am Lamb of God. I am the Savior of the world. I am that I am before Abraham was. I am. Jesus is God. And he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But he humbled himself and was found in the fashion of man. And he was obedient even to the death of the cross. Whereas at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord. That's written in the book of Philippians. And Jesus then humbled himself. He was broken and spilled out for us. And this is why we began our session today with the words that the most holy one of eternity would never despise the cry, the heart cry of those that are contrite and broken and humble. And so here we are. We are truly God's children. But our Jesus, he set the pattern. He set the way. Now, when he came down to uh, speak with his disciples on that very special day, he did humble himself. He was on his knees. And then he stood up. And he took that towel and he wiped the feet of the disciples. And everything is very, a pattern of the symbols of the things that would actually come to pass later on. Because he humbled himself, he went to the cross, his life was broken and spilled out. There was water that spilled out from his side. You see, the water and the blood. So both the water and the blood are significant in the speaking and the teaching about Jesus. When he spoke to Peter, <laughs> oh, our Peter, he is so presumptuous. Who can remember what he said? And perhaps David would know this um, out of um, the book of Matthew, chapter 16. What are the various things that Peter had um, declared about Jesus that are recorded in the book of Matthew? Well, uh, Jesus had asked, uh, who do men say that I am? And they gave different answers. And then Jesus said, uh, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Man, Jesus affirmed what he said by telling him, uh, flesh and blood has not given this revelation to you, but your father in heaven has given this to you. And then he went on to say uh, on this, he said, your name is, uh, he said, your name is Petros in the Greek, which means a little stone. And then he said on this, Petra, which is big rock, I will build my church. Yes. So uh, if you look at the original language, he's saying the revelation that you, your father gave you upon this revelation, I will build my church. And the yes. gates of hell will not prevail against it. Yes. Uh, the gates of hell are actually defensive. <laughs> the church is on the offensive, right? Yes. And the gates will not prevail against the church. And Jesus is the chief 
cornerstone, isn't he? Mm -hmm. And Golgotha Hill, you see, was looming in the face of those disciples that day. And Golgotha Hill actually uh, is in the shape of a skull because it looks like a skull. Is, is there anyone, I believe it's Carla, you've been there, you've mm -hmm. seen Golgotha, haven't you? Could you yes. share a little bit about your experience there at the very place? Well, that probably my first tour we went there and yes, it, it does look like a skull. Um, so yeah, it's quite remarkable to be there and think about the history and, um, but yes, it does look like a skull in the, yeah. in the side of the hill there. The one thing that um, I remember reading, I don't know where right now, but when they uh, took out the, uh, off of that hill, off of Gol Golgotha Hill, they took the eyes and the mouth and those various uh, elements of, this, of the picture of a skull. They removed that because it was used in a quarry. And so what was left was the face of a skull. And so what the builders rejected, you see, became the face of a skull, kind of in the natural. And I think that's kind of a neat simile. Jesus speaks further in Matthew, chapter 16. It's a part of the answer to what was going to happen in, in the um, book of Acts. Peter becomes the leader of that church, doesn't he? And Jesus has spoken to Peter clearly, and he said um, that you will have the keys to heaven and hell. He says that to us today. Whatever we shall bind in heaven shall be bound in earth. You see, whatever we loose in heaven shall be loose in earth. So we have that power. If we come and humble ourselves before the Father, there is a qualifier. It is a humbling. It is going from the outer court through into the holy place and into the holy of holies. There's a qualifier. Truly, yes, we will all be saved, but we'll be outer court. The book of um, Matthew also tells us in Matthew 25, that half of the believers will not enter in to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's rather startling and rather frightening. They will remain in the outer court. They will remain there because they're not going deeper and fuller into the Spirit of God. They must come through the labor and be washed and cleansed. The labor comes up again, even in chapter 3, with um, Nicodemus, because he holds up that serpent in the wilderness made of brass. Well, the labor is brass. It speaks of judgment. And so we must come through the labor, the cleansing, the cleansing of the water of the word, you see, that will cleanse our soul so that we can go further into the Holy of Holies. And now we receive communion, and we have today communion. But you cannot drink of it unworthily. What does that mean? It means that you have got to go through the outer court. Salvation, the brazen altar, the burning away of the dross in our life, to the labor, to the cleansing, you see, by the water of the word, which is the Bible. And from there, you can enter in and take communion as we have. And so we take communion today. And now the Shekinah light of glory is upon us and his very presence will come and enter our sanctuary. It's his sanctuary because he takes his dwelling place within us. This is his sanctuary. And now we can give forth our prayers and we can pray. We have the altar of incense alive and working in our life. And now we go to the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat of God. Here our prayers are answered. It's a process, but it's truth, absolute truth. What is in the Holy of Holies? The bud that Aaron's rod budded, speaking of authority and government. Government is on his shoulders. The pot of manna is in the Ark of the Covenant, the bread of life. We've taken the bread of life and communion. Jesus is in the covenant. And he is the fulfillment of the law. 
That's the third thing that is within the Ark of the Covenant. The two tablets that were brought down over them from the mountain of Sinai by Moses. The tablets of the law. Jesus, fulfillment. Mercy seat of God. One piece. One piece of furniture in the Holy of Holies. So there's a progression, my friends, and this is the message that we have today. It comes out of John 13, that we might be broken under the love of God and believe sincerely and deeply in all the promises of the word. He has taught us progressively through the book of John, and we've already seen how it moves. It moves so clearly. He calls the disciples. He brings and shows heaven to earth, chapter 2. He shows that there is judgment, chapter 3. But there's healing in the judgment, chapter 3. And he chose to show that to chapter 4, to the woman at the well. He's no respecter of persons. He comes and he says, the river of life shall flow out of you. And out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Then, deeply into chapter 5, he sees that expressed as he raises the man out of the pools of Bethesda. We have been, in a way, in America, that Laodicean church crippled, laying there, waiting for something to happen, waiting for some angel to take us out of this situation. But Jesus is walking by today, right now. Won't you be healed? Pick up your bed and walk. So we stand up and we walk with Jesus. He will walk with us. He will talk with us if we've gone all the way with him. He is here for us right now, taking us out of the pools of Bethesda, chapter 5 in John. Chapter 6, we've taken the bread. I am the bread of life. I'm the great I am. Chapter 7, out of the innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. We're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says later on in chapter 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you could do nothing. Abide in me and I in you. And you will do all things are possible. That is an abiding life which we have in Christ. That's out of 15 and it's coming. It's really close. We must abide in him today to get through all of this, you see. Chapter 11, he describes. Chapter 10, of course, he's the good shepherd. Chapter 11, he raises the dead. That's the power of Jesus. Chapter 12, he is declared the Messiah as he comes through the gates of Jerusalem on precisely the day that is written of in the book of Daniel. He answers the 70th week. He is the 70th week answer, but it doesn't happen in his day, and it hasn't happened yet in our day. It will yet come, that last week of seven years. It will come, you see, for the tribulation. Out of great love, God will send tribulation because he will bring in his people Israel in those seven years. It is yet to come. Jesus did not read that last sentence from Isaiah 61, which says, and the day of the wrath of God, because it had not come in his day, and it has not come in our day yet. We have not seen the wrath of God as yet. It is yet to come. It is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Will it happen? Oh, yes. Will we be here? Oh, no. We are the church. He will take us up. When that which restrains, when the restrainer is removed, and that is the Holy Spirit, which dwells in all of us, we shall go up. And that speaks of those that have enough light in their lamp, enough oil in their lamp. It speaks of the unity of the Spirit, enough oil in our lamp that we could keep on glowing until the very end. And then God will open the door and say, come in, well done, faithful servant. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just know that I know that I know that what these words are saying are absolutely true. And God is spot on with his timing as we look at John 13. And Carly just read the words that he said, go and do likewise. Yeah. We're to wash one another's feet. We're to pray for our enemies. We're to pray for those that despitefully use us. We're to believe God to do all things and do all things perfectly. His mercy is everlasting. And we started this session today, as Susan had read and said, his mercies are new every day. His mercies are new every day. Now we come to a section of John 13. And I want us to understand that there is a connection here between what David just read in Matthew 16. And as we look at um, this section of John 13, 
Um, there is a part of Matthew 16, which, um, David, would you go back there to that scripture and read that part, please? It would be um, from verse 24 of Matthew 16, verse 24 to 28. Would you read that, please? <clears throat> sure. <clears throat> this is uh, King James. Yes, that's then, fine. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, <clears throat> If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Yes, powerful, powerful words. Chapter 17 will speak of the Mount of Transfiguration. And the disciples of that day saw the glory of God come on that mountain. And Jesus stood there with Moses and Elijah. And these three disciples, Peter, James, and John, they wanted to make a great tabernacle for, uh, to celebrate this vision. But Jesus sent them back into the Valley of Need. And that is a connector there between the fact that Jesus has said, some of you will not die until you see the glory of God. And I believe that that is just as true for that day as it is for today. Can you say amen? We are going to see the glory of God upon this earth before he takes us to heaven. I know that we shall see that glory. And I am believing it is really close. I am believing that the manifest glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God shall pour down over this land, that God will heal this land, and that we shall see him even as he sees us, and it will happen even as we are standing here on planet Earth. I have that much faith to believe this absolute truth. I know that I know this is going to happen. And I believe today as we read the rest of that chapter in the book of Matthew, that we are to pick up our cross and follow him. And here we are saying, Lord, can we do that? And each of us has a different cross. <laughs> your cross won't fit my life and my cross won't fit your life. But it will come to pass, even as he has decreed it. The judgments as of the good shepherd that have placed on our life, those, those moments where we have gone through valleys of difficulties, he has been right there with us. He has set a table before us in the very presence of our enemies. He is our God. He has walked through the valley with us. We have never been hurt or burned that he wasn't with us. We have not gone through things that he hasn't stood right there and said, it's all right. I will get you through this. Can you say amen? I could say that. I've gone through some really, really serious things. And always he was right there. And always I knew whatever happens, God, it's okay. Today is not any different than it was a few years ago. I'm saying, God, please come, Lord Jesus. Come, to come. The bride and the spirit say, come, come. And that's my cry today. He is with us. He will feed us in the midst of our enemies. He will take care of us. He will anoint our heads with oil as long as we're in unity and love one another and pray for our enemies and forgive 70 times 70. Can you say yes, we'll forgive? How hard to forgive, but we will because he forgave us. <laughs> All of us have been forgiven by the power and the mercy of God. His mercies are new every day. His grace, his mercy is all over us, even right now as we speak. And so we pick up our cross. We deny ourselves those things that maybe we really would like to do. 
we only listen to good music. We only listen to things that, you know, inspire us, that, that, that keep us going in the things of God. We don't cloud our heart or our mind with negative things. And we speak truth, even if it hurts, to those that are around us. We can only speak truth to our children. Come what may, they may never want to speak to you again. I have several grandchildren in the universities. That just made me weep with everything in me because they're, they're listening to wrong teaching. It bothers me deeply. There's nothing I can do except pray. They respect my authority in so many different ways and also my belief they respect it. But they need to come to Jesus, several of them. And I say this in the hope that they will see this video someday and know how much their grandmother cares. I care in brokenness and in prayer, like a Jabeth, every day of my life. And so we know we must pick up our cross and follow him. Now, John 13, there's a section of scripture where we're gonna really perhaps um, speak our mind. Um, the next part here, um, I'm asking, Dominic, maybe you would read the next section of John 13. Um, it's really important. This is a most important scripture. Um, Jesus said, and let's begin verse, um, oh, well, I'll just finish 13, 17. He said, um, if you know these things, happy are you if you do it. And so what are these things? Verse 16, verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than the one that sent him. <laughs> okay, so we have a bond servant mentality. We are with the all of the bond servant, even though we've been set free. And took, yes, stand fast in liberty wherewith we've been set free and do not return and be entangled to the things of the world. We have done that and we believe and we are, we put the all in our ear and we say, Lord, we are your bond servant, just like Paul did. Yes, I will follow you wherever you take me said uh, Ruth to Naomi, wherever you send me, wherever I go, I will go with you. I will never leave you. I will always follow you. Your God will be my God. And that's what Ruth, the little person from the, the um, Moab, and she was a heathen, she said she would follow Naomi, who's obviously a, a Christian. And Ruth, what happens? She becomes the progenitor of Christ because she was a bondservant to her, uh, to her relative. A powerful statement out of the Old Testament. We are that today. Could you say amen, every one of you? Amen. Are you bond servants to Christ? Will you follow him no matter what he says for you to do? It's going to be a hard one because you don't know and I don't know what he's going to ask of us. It's coming. And whatever he does, it's okay with my soul because we're bond servants. Wherever you send me. And that is verse 16. He said, happier, happy are you, verse 17, if you do know these things, happy are you if you do it. Now, would you read um, Dominic, verse 18, on through to, um, hmm, how far? Yes, <laughs> verse 30, please. You bet. A section. <clears throat> you said 18? Yes, please. Verse, chapter 13, verse 18, on to verse 30, please. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it come to pass, when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had said, had had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. 
He then lying on Jesus' breast said unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And then after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus said unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had that bag, that Jesus, Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Yes, powerful. Yeah. The picture of this moment with those disciples. And they said, is it you? Is it you? They didn't know. And Judas runs out and he does the evil deed. And Jesus would say, do it quickly because he knew all about it. Now we're going to come to a word and it's called predestination. And I would like uh, anyone that would like to comment on the word predestination and omniscience. Uh, it might uh, jump right in on this conversation. Uh, what do you believe predestination means in the sense of Judas Iscariot? It, is he uh, once saved, always saved? Jesus had said, I don't want to lose one of them. I haven't lost one of them that you've given me. Uh, how does this work in your thinking? I, I just open this up to um, whomever would like to comment. And anyone that would like to comment. All right, I'll call on you. <laughs> David, how do you feel about predestination? Well, it's actually a very complicated philosophical issue. Um, and uh, many places, even in the same verse, you may find uh, God's sovereignty and man's own decision, right? And ph philosophers debate, theologians debate, do we really have free choice? <laughs> if God is ordaining uh, the decision. And uh, what we see is uh, it's a complex thing. Uh, we know from experience that we make choices and that those choices have consequences. So that's indisputable. Uh, we also know that, that God has ordained that certain things are going to be going to take place. Uh, that's the essence of prophecy there. However, some prophecies are conditional. If the person involved uh, makes the right choices, they can actually change the destiny, all right? So it's not just a real cut and dry thing. Uh, of course, we're creatures of time, and God is outside of time, and yeah. we'll probably experience that in uh, in eternity, right? Uh, someone said that uh, time is God's invention to keep everything from happening at once, but he sees the whole picture, <laughs> and uh, so we can't really understand what it is to see the whole picture outside of time. Um, so all these things, all these factors are issues there. Uh, one thing for sure, we have free will and our choices matter, okay? And one thing also is that God is going to accomplish everything that he has declared he's going to accomplish, whether we're part of it or not. <laughs> we can be part of it, and that's, that's the good thing if it's, if it's one of the positive prophecies. Uh, but we can make a choice to not be part of it, right? But yeah, God yeah. loves the church. Jesus loves the church, and the church is those who decided to be part of uh, the collective bride of Christ. Amen. And that's our calling. I believe that's the most beautiful explanation of predestination I've ever heard. Thank you, David. That was absolutely wonderful. Anybody else that'd like to comment on that? Because it's a huge topic. And uh, haven't there been arguments over this for centuries? Um, anybody like to jump in on that? Because it is a big, powerful topic. Um, um, yeah, whoops. I'd like to comment more about Judas and the scripture there that said um, when he gave him that piece of bread that then Satan entered him, he'd had a thought before. They, they could have probably all had thoughts before, but at that point, it said Satan entered him. And then when Jesus said, what you do, do quickly, 
I'm wondering, was he talking to Judas or was he talking to Satan and saying, Satan, whatever you're going to do, do quickly. Yes. Um, I read a book this spring right around Easter. I picked it up somewhere and the book was called Iscariot. And it was actually a fictionalized account of Judas. It was very biblical, very um, and very eye-opening. Um, it was actually, I think, a, a, a bestseller, best-selling book. I don't remember the author at the moment, but uh, what was so fascinating about it was if we, you know, Judas has been the epitome of betrayal, and uh, there's probably a little bit of Judas in all of us, or at least we have experienced that part in someone else. I personally think betrayal is one of the hardest things to forgive and walk through. But in this book, she, she made a, a case more of Judas himself growing up in Israel, growing up um, with the harshness of the Roman Empire. I mean, if we think that some of the evil stuff that's come out of the Middle East is bad, bad beheadings, the, the Romans were brutal in many ways. And so with them being like that, you know, he hoped, as all of them did, for someone to deliver them from that kind of thing. And in the book, um, he, he has actually experienced, like I say, this is a, a fiction book, so to speak, but that, you know, his own father was, was crucified for trying to follow. Because Judas, from what I've seen, was a real follower of the law. But like many people, he became disillusioned with what he was not seeing. And he was vulnerable in the sense that um, he, wanted, he wanted to see Jesus do something. In the book, she talked a lot about the disciples and about how bewildered they would be at some of the things Jesus would say and, you know, and how maybe their family's like, why are you hanging around with this man? He's got all these crazy things he's saying. But I think what the book did for me was put a human face on Judas as far as not just being this villain that was, uh, you know, slinking around with them that whole time. But he actually had a, a good heart and a good intention, but somewhere, and this happens in woundedness with people, um, his disappointment became an occasion for him to uh, betray. But the other thing is that he regretted it so deeply and realized in many ways in the way the book is written, he was, uh, he was played by the, by the Pharisees. They, they had already kind of been looking for someone to get at Jesus through. And when he realized that he had been sort of suckered into their plans, he was so distraught that he went out and, and committed suicide and killed himself. But I think that probably uh, one of the things I came to realize that Judas having been with Jesus, loved Jesus, wanted to see things happen, but they weren't happening fast enough. <laughs> and at that point, um, the deception entered in. It could have been any one of them. They all said, is it I? You know, they all knew at some point they could be capable. Uh, but going along with the idea of predestination, it was, you know, foretold that someone would betray him but still choices were made. And I think in the vulnerability of who, the, the political dynamics of that time, Judas was very, very vulnerable, very gullible, and he, he became the betrayer. So just thought I'd offer that. Just, it was a, an amazing book for me to read. It just put a human face on him um, that, you know, within us all, we have probably, had occasion to betray someone or feel betrayed. Wow, amazing, beautiful. Thank you so much, Carla, for those insightful words. And yes, <laughs> there goes any one of us, <laughs> you know, but in the providence of God. All of our faith, all of our belief, and all of the things that we're able to do are from him and in us and back to him again. And so for each and every one of us, we have a lot of food for thought. 
I thank you very much, David and Carla, for those insightful words. They were powerful and wonderful. And yes, it is a spirit, a spirit of betrayal, and it's the spirit of the enemy that is pervasive all around the land today. And is there anyone else that would like to add to this? This is a, a powerful subject and one that we really wanted to get into. And I, I knew we would. So anyone well, else before we move on? One of the things I just uh, want to say. This subject the, uh, ties in yes, with... Uh, uh, Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, both of you, uh, let's let's take um, let's take uh, Jackie first, and then we'll go back to David. Jackie, one one of the things I think we have to consider is that Judas was stealing from the the pocket there that he was supposed to be in charge of. I think it's interesting that he would be the one put in charge of the money since he had obviously some greedy intentions. So you have to think, you know, okay, he's, he's in charge of the money uh, bag and he has problems with, with greed. So therefore he opened himself up to an, uh, another demonic attack when he started to take the money out of the money bag. That was step one. Step two, which is really unbelievable, uh, when I carefully read the the um, the accounts, J Judas had gone to the high priests and and he had made this agreement with them. So to him, do what you're going to do quickly. He had already collaborated with them because he could not collaborate with them on the Passover. He had to do this before. If you read it carefully, he collaborated with them. The day that they had the dinner at Simon the leper's house, that's when he went out and started to talk to the high priest. So when he pretended to be so innocent, what, me, Lord? He had already confabulated this whole thing. So when he left the Passover, he, what he was going to do was he was going to run to those people and say, okay, now we go to the, to the Mount of Olives. So he was not this innocent guy. He had opportunities, but he just... Now, I do agree with the fact that he thought that Jesus was going to usher in the kingdom that was going to put the Romans to, to, uh, but they all, they all thought that, but he was the one that was susceptible because he was stealing. And then, you know, he had other issues after that. So when you start, when you put your foot in the water and you start to, to rebel in small ways, the rebellion keeps growing. And that, that's where he wound up big, big yes. time rebellion. Ec excellent comments. And the, one more point on that line. Um, they were all pretty familiar with scripture. And it was written that Jesus would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. And I'm sure that uh, many of them knew the book of Daniel, too. I mean, all these things were historically available to these uh, Jewish people. If they had read the scripture, they would have known. And so, David, do you have another comment? To make? This is uh, yes. I wanted to... Uh taken a look at one part of the of John chapter 12. You and I discussed this uh, yesterday, <clears throat> and it's uh, verse, particularly verse 37 through 41, and it describes uh, the people's rejection of Jesus. He had just said in verse 36, while you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. <clears throat> And then in verse 37 through 41, it reads, But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled. When he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory spoken of him. Amen. Um, that's very puzzling. It sort of uh, harks back to where it says in Exodus that, that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And when we talk about Judas, um, did, uh, we know that it was prophesied somebody would betray him. And so in what, to what extent was it uh, free will versus destiny? Yes. Um, there's a very 
worthwhile study you can do on that. Uh, verse 39 and 40 is actually uh, a, a paraphrase of Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. And in those verses, Isaiah had just been, just received his commission to be a prophet to Israel. And the Lord spoke to him this way. This is in Isaiah 6, verse 9. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull. This is God speaking to Isaiah. And their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Amen. Very puzzling in a way, because you know, as we read in 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish. That's right. That all should come to repentance. Yet you see that even though God hardened Pharaoh's heart, uh, this is another example to try to understand what's happening here. Uh, Pharaoh, most in most of the, the, the plagues, uh, right up until the plague of the locusts, Pharaoh was hardening his own heart. And it got into just about the, the eighth plague. And uh, this is in Exodus 10.10. 10. Now, now the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants that I may show these signs of mine before him. So it's kind of similar to Jackie, what you're saying about Judas was uh, making some choices there ahead of Satan entering into him on that last part. Uh, so there's this interaction of people making the wrong choices and then it gets worse, right? Um, and, but this is interesting that in Exodus, uh, after those words that I just read, uh, the Lord is continuing to speak to Moses and he says that you may tell uh, in the hearing of your son and your son's sons, the mighty things I've done in Egypt and my signs, which I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. So here God is saying, I've hardened their hearts so that they may know the glory of the Lord, know him. Yes. Amen. So there is an overriding concern of God that people would know him. And in some cases he will actually harden the hearts of some people so that others may know him. Yet those who are receiving that hardening, they're also participating in it. They're not, they're not without uh, a cause in, in that. And what ties this all together is in Romans chapter 11, uh, Paul explains how God caused the unbelief and spiritual blindness of the Jewish people to work together for good. And that's a very right. wonderful right. part of Romans 11 that I would recommend uh, studying if, if anyone wants to pursue this. Uh, in verse 7 of Romans 11, Paul says, What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, such as the apostles, <laughs> and the rest were blinded. Yes. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear. To this very day so yes. god participated in the blinding of his own people yes. Yes. yet he had a, a overriding wonderful good that he yes. was going to bring out of it the and powerful scripture yeah. is that uh yeah. you have already said that uh, all things work together for good to those Amen. that's are, part of it yeah. and are called according to his purpose Amen. And as we conclude our time together today, this has been a rich and a powerful and a wonderful discussion. I think we need to look at the one word that can explain what we need to see. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. God is God. And all things are from him, in us, and back to him. And God is good. God is good. He is a good God. And he's in a good mood. And his plan is that all should come to repentance and no one should be lost. Our God is an everlasting, merciful, and wonderful God. We must trust him. Trust the Lord with all our heart. Lean not upon our understanding. And he will bring all things together for good. And he will give you the desire of your heart. The last part of chapter 13 is where he says, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. So it's all about Jesus. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straight away, straight away glorify him. Little children, 
yet in a what? A little while, I am with you, and you will seek me, but where I go, you cannot go. And a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And that's where we will end today, because Jesus did give comments to Peter about the fact that he would deny him three times. So repeating again, verse 34, love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And God is love. And we begin next week, chapter 14, where he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. So let's believe for that, my friends. Thank you for today, and we're going to close our session. Amen.